and they, I appreciate you clearing out, you know, that wooded area right there when you come into the driveway. I said, I don't care if you come in here and cut it as long as you realize that's my property. We honor the Lord on tonight. Wednesday night Bible study here at City of Refuge Christian Center. Church of God in Christ in the city of Benfield. Thank God for all of you that are that faithfully come. And we thank God for those that will watch the Bible study via our Facebook live feed, live stream, and our YouTube re broadcast. Want to talk tonight about how to stay victorious. We've, we've been talking over the last few weeks about the enemy of truth and how we combat it. The only way we combat sin and the enemy of truth is we have to embrace God's word by his spirit. We can't be hearers of the word only. So in Hebrews chapter 4 tonight, We want to just talk about one of the promises that the Lord guarantees. And here's how God has, has demonstrated his word. He's done this more than once. God has promised refuge and deliverance and the promised land uh, several times in the Bible. He promises a eternal promised land when we go be with the Lord. But right here on the earth, we can operate in the promised land. It is called in the New Testament, the kingdom of heaven. And the way it works, fakers can't get in. Now y'all with me? Deceivers can't get in. The tricksters can't get in. The people that can readily fool us on the outside, they're not able to get in because the Holy Spirit is standing at the door. And if we're not willing and obedient, if we're not having faith in God's word cheerfully, the Holy Spirit prevents us from operating in the kingdom where the kingdom gifts are. Jesus told the disciples, he told Jerusalem, he said, the kingdom of heaven is come. The kingdom of heaven is now. He said, when in the last days, when the false prophet comes and says, lo, the Lord is here. Lo, the Lord is there. He said, don't even believe that. He said, because the kingdom of heaven is in you. The kingdom of heaven is now. The eternal kingdom where Jesus will reign and you won't have to see it spiritually happens when we leave this present world, leave this present body and go be with the Lord. But the Lord says, while we are yet here on the earth, we can operate using God's spiritual tools using the spiritual gifts, operating in the kingdom, even though we're yet in the world. These are the things the Lord says when he says, I'm going to show you the mystery of the Bible. He told the church, I'm going to reveal things to you that those that don't love me, they will not be able to get it. You can read this Bible every day and not confess Jesus Christ or not live or even attempt to live holy. I know people that drink, uh, um, do everything they want to do. Gamble, cuss, bust. And they get up and read their Bible every day. I've gone into people's houses and they had all kind of mess going on. And they have a Bible right there on the coffee table. And they may even open the books, but they don't believe it. And you say, well, I talk to unsaved people all the time, and 
They believe, they believe the Bible. Well, Jesus says the only way you can demonstrate that you believe the Bible, he said, if you love me, you keep my word. There was a benefit to it. See, we make salvation hard because we operate too much in our own will. We try to be good. We try to do good. But <clears throat> one thing Paul said to the Romans, he said, if you walk in the flesh, he said, you will die. He said, but if you by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you mortify the deeds of the flesh, he said, you will live. So what he meant by that, we've got to trust in what God is doing. And we've got to embrace the teaching. We've got to embrace the belief. We have to embrace the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit works for us. It keeps us joined with Jesus. It keeps us joined with the Father. The way we communicate with God through prayer, it is the Holy Spirit that separates earnest prayer from desperate prayer from empty prayer. God hears all prayer. But the Bible says when we hit that place where we need to talk to the Lord, it's the Holy Spirit that comes to help us in our infirmity. To help us to commune with the Lord. This is why a lot of times when people pray, and we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4, when people pray, and we all learn this way, we'll get in our prayer, we'll get into our prayer stance, and then we just sit there for 20 or 30 minutes. If that and just tell God what we want. I was going through our video uh, uh, library today, praying about what we will, you know, Lord, what do you want us to, to play on Sunday? And there was this one song there. And I like the song. But, you know, the guy was sitting there in the world and said, Lord, I want you to do this. God, you said you was going to do this. I don't believe you're going to do this. And come do it right now. And I said, oh, no, we can't play that. We don't command anything of God. We seek his favor. Now, God is okay with us praying his word. Lord, you said, your word says, Lord, bring it to pass. But in the end, whose will be done? Whose will? His will. We can't command nothing of God. Scripture says, if, I, if, if you stand on this, on God's promise, first of all, we talked about this before. There are those promises that God make that are non-binding. Father has a covenant relationship with us. And there are blessings that God gave that are unconditional. Then there are blessings that God gives that are conditional. We like to say, salvation is free. But if you want to walk on the mountaintop, if you want to walk on the water, if you want to be a spokesman for God, then it's going to cost you. But what it's going to cost you, here is the miracle. It's going to cost you things you don't need anyway. And so there are unconditional promises. There is an unconditional covenant that God has with everybody. He calls it the rain in the sinner's yard, then he calls it the rain in your yard. When the sun comes up in infield, it comes up in Sodom and Gomorrah too, if they existed. But then there is a covenant relationship that God embraces his people. It helps us to stay strong 
in times in history where the word and God's message is being challenged. And there is no greater time we know of in the world where God's message is being challenged more than what it is now. My wife likes to watch the what we both do. The gladiator and and just watch movies in history that show how people responded or how people behaved during history. Man has always been rebellious. But God always made a way for his people. Do y'all believe that? It's no different today. The only difference today, me and my wife talk about it often, back before radio, television, the telephone, the internet, airplanes, all that stuff, God could talk to you. I believe those people that live in isolated areas where they're not distracted uh, by technology, I think God speaks to them. He has to speak to them directly because the message of God is going to go forth. God said in the new covenant, he's going to put his word in us. So if you've got people living out in the woods somewhere that have been, and, and we learned this during the Iraq and Iran war. There are people living out there in the mountains that had no communication whatsoever. I think God, he speaks to them in the way he speaks to them. The Bible exists. They can't read. They don't even have a Bible. God finds a way. He found a way to talk to John. He found a way to talk to the apostles. He found a way to talk to Harriet Tubman, he found a way to talk to all the people that have done things in history and they say they were motivated by God, by statements or by commissions that are not in the Bible. If you listen to some of the stories, Martin Luther, John Wesley, uh, uh, Bishop C.H. Mason that started this great church. They all had a message from God. And to do that, we have to be courageous and recognize the tough part we have as Christians is we try to take our own power and get things done rather than trust on God. The writer says in Hebrews chapter 4, he said, let us therefore fear be concerned. He said, lest a promise being left us, watch this, we'll talk a lot about this tonight, entering into God's rest. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise of entering into God's rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Even in the Old Testament, when the Lord spoke to Israel, he said to them that, hey, I'm going to lead you into the promised land. And I'm going to take you into a place filled with milk and honey, into a land filled with milk and honey. But here, the writer is in the New Testament. And he's talking to them about entering into God's rest. When they left Israel, they were in God's rest. When they left Egypt, how do we know? What gives it away? First, God made provision for them. They didn't have to hunt food. They didn't have to go fishing. They didn't have to go worry about finding grease in the frying pan. They didn't have to worry about water. God made provision for them. He led them in the day by cloud. He led them at night by fire. They were in God. All they had to do was follow God. But like us, they had one major distraction. The five of the five senses 
that a human being has. The one that will get you in the most trouble is them two things above your nose. The eyes. What the eyes see, the eyes is the portal to the soul. And what goes into your eyes filters first through your brain. So it's how you see things. I was talking to an attorney downtown today and we were talking about issues. And he said something that sometimes we have to force ourselves to remember. No matter what's going on, and we preach this every day, no matter what's going on, God is in it. No matter what circumstance occurs, pandemics, wars, culture classes, the Bible declares this too shall pass. Because we're not going anywhere until God says so. Why? We, we are entered into his rest. Our mind causes us conflict. It challenges our faith because what we're seeing is a reality. But the outcome is controlled by God. That's why somebody can get shot in the head and live. Yes, sir. Uh, can you help me out there, Pastor A? They still murmured and groaned, and I believe that's with faith. Um, I was telling my daughter how you know, I used to think, thank you, sister, that you know that the only rest when you get to heaven. But then the Lord is showing me I can rest right here. It's like you said when everything is falling off around you, and the Lord would be like, peace be still, just be still, and remembering. That God is still in control. It's not what it looked like, but there, I believe that's where, like you said, your relationship with God, and that's where faith kick in. Because it's really not the way we see it through our eyes is not the way God see it. Because there's nothing too hard for Him. So when you talk about the children of Israel, even from the beginning when they were leading them out, uh, use Moses to lead them out. They were just moaning, groaning, complaining. Well, we should have went back to Egypt because we wouldn't have had to be dealing with all of this, right? And that's what you're saying about us. But I think it still comes with a relationship and your faith truly have to kick in. Because the Bible said that, you know what, you should live by faith. And faith make you, no matter what's going on around us, that it make you believe that God is. I am the great that I am. And that he's still in control. Amen. Because if we back up to chapter 3, very well said. If we back up to chapter 3, verse 6. Paul writes, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. See, we have to always be professing our faith. Mm -hmm. Our faith is Jesus. Even in a material world where everything you see, hear, touch, feel, taste, or smell connects you to the material, the metaphysical world, our relationship with God is spiritual. Mm -hmm. This is why the Lord says the carnal mind cannot discern spiritual things. But Paul writes, Who's but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. No battle, most battles got victorious. They're not victorious until the battle is over. And even when they win the battle, there are casualties. Mm -hmm. We win a battle, 
What about all the people that got killed? The order says, the Bible is saying, if you are a casualty of the gospel, you still win. I used to wonder how foolish it sounded when these Vikings took pleasure and died. You remember the one man that said, I want to go and fight because I don't worry. I want to die on the battlefield. In America, in the modern world, we've been sidetracked into thinking that our walk with the Lord is supposed to be without cost. We should be fortunate. As fortunate as we are in America, we see the challenge in America as a big deal. Just because people talk about us as Christians. Well, you got people that's dying every day yes. in the world for professing Jesus. This is why Jesus said, if he told the disciples when they were rebuking and rejecting the teaching, he said, hey, if the people in Nineveh, if the people in Sodom and Gomorrah had seen and heard what y'all have seen and heard, they would have repented. The Lord is saying, if the people in America could see the suffering that really goes on for our faith, God put us here to be the mouthpiece in this present time. There is no guarantee America lasts until the end. Yes, that's right. But the Lord is saying, we have to recognize he says in verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Spirit talks to us. The Lord says in Hebrews chapter 1, he says, In God at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet. Had in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed, heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. We never give the devil the luxury of victory if we stay holy. What happens is we, we allow issues to try our faith. It's human. This is why Paul said, I punished my flesh. I kept under my body. I keep under my body. And I bring it into subjection. Lest after I have preached, I became a castaway. The devil will always keep us off God. But he don't have to do the work. Satan don't have to do all the work. James said, when you sin, don't say you are tempted of God. But God cannot be tempted with sin. A man is a man sins when he's tempted and drawn away of his own lust. Satan feeds our own lust, which is what causes us to not have fellowship with the Lord. Look what he said to the children of Israel. Thus said the Holy Ghost. Today, if you hear his voice, that's what we endeavor to do with prayer, with fasting, with studying. Come into worship service. You know, uh, um, he said, harden not your heart. Watch this. As in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. And the Lord got me working on the sermon. Title, In the Wilderness. Trust in God. Everybody has a wilderness experience. More than one. But the real one comes with the true conversion. He said, harden not your heart. As in the day of provocation, in the wilderness, watch verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works. God kept. What hurt them was 
Their faith wasn't in God. Their faith was in Moses. This is why God said in the New Testament, yes. you won't need the priest. You won't need Moses and Joshua. I'm going to put them there. I'm going to give you shepherds after my own heart to guide and to teach you. But I'm going to deal with you individually now. So that the prophet can't lead you astray unless you want to be led. I believe when people, and we would look talk, we were talking about it last week in the book of Peter, when the churches and ministries and people that represent God use God's people as merchandise. Because that's what Peter told them would happen when their hearts became callous. And they took their eyes off God and put their eyes on people. He said, when these false teachers and false prophets come, they will use you as merchandise. But the Lord says, I'm going to speak to you. He says, I kept them. They saw my works. Verse 10 says, wherefore I was grieved with them. Why? He said, they do always err in their heart and never took the time to learn God's way. Now, we know from the Bible, a lot of Old Testament people did. The Bible talked about the prophetess in the book of Luke who lived her whole life waiting to see the coming of the Lord. It talked about Simeon, who lived his whole life just waiting to see Jesus be born. He talked about uh, uh, Job being a just man. He talked about uh, Noah being a just man. So there were people that trusted God. But in the last days, God says he's speaking to us through his word. So every Christian ought to endeavor to live their life in the word. I guarantee you, if you commit to this Bible and ask God for the Holy Spirit, over time, it becomes a part of you. You feel naked when you don't spend time with God. Yeah. And by the Holy Spirit being in us, you don't always have to be at your bed on your knees. Now we should bow down before God at some point during the day. But we can have fellowship with God all the time. But with God, yes ma'am. Also, if you know what he was saying, we always go back to the heart. You know, I always use the word passion. When people are passionate, that's where they tend to give more of their time. Oh. Um, one thing I, I when you read the Bible, God always go back to the heart. If you notice, you didn't hear this verse. He's talking about the heart. And one thing I'm recognizing, um, man, when he have a passion for something, it has to be in the heart. He geared to kind of uh, go towards this way because it's a passion. It's something he enjoys, something he loves. You know, doing. But also, um, when I think about when we use that uh, scripture so loosely to be uh, absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, people really don't know what they mean. I find myself now, even at my age and my walk with the Lord, and we say we in the army of the Lord. It's easy to sit there and say, but I think to myself now trying to discipline my mind because we know we didn't come here to stay. But I'm thinking about when they went to that school and um, shot up at Colorado, and they said the young lady, they wanted her to denounce um, her uh, her God, and she was like, no, and it shot her in the head and killed her. And I was like, how many of us sit there and really, it, it takes some discipline in your mind to say, if somebody walked up in here and with a smile on your face and said, denounce your God, and no, and I'm ready to go to be with the Lord. I believe at that split second, the Lord just give us a spiritual being like, it's going to be all right because you're going to be better off to be from here, from the physical part, to be with the Lord. We say it, but you really, I think to myself, 
Do a lot of us really know what we are saying. It's easy to say, be like Peter. You know, get scared and deny when the trouble comes. So I find myself, I think it comes disciplining your mind. How far would you go for your God? Because that's where we at now. Because well, the Christian sure are going to give a tax. Well, Jesus had said that they honor me with their lips. Yes. He said, but their hearts are far from yes. me. And we're living in a time now where the Lord is saying, you're going to have to walk and you're going to have to confess your faith. Because what's happening in our culture today, the enemy, the devil is doing us like he did Eve. He's, he's, he's hoping us for the back door. He's not coming directly at you. Saying, I want you to go steal something. I want you to go cheat somebody. I want you to go lie to somebody. You know, I want you to go kill somebody. He challenges our everyday belief system. And he challenges it by exposing it to people, situations we're in. He'll put us in a desperate situation to see if we will trust God. He will challenge us through our family and our children to see if he, we will trust God. He would challenge our jobs to see if we would trust God. I always tell the story when I was the chief at Greenville, how when we had Christmas event, and all the chiefs, department heads were sitting at the king's table. And he, the director, went around the room asking all the chiefs what their departments were doing for, you know, their Christmas get-together, Christmas parties. And the assistant director, number two guy in the hospital said, what are y'all doing for Christmas? And his social worker, the chief of social work, corrected him. Said it's not Christmas, it's Exodus. And he actually backed down. He didn't profess to be saved. He backed down and said, oh yeah, you're right. Exodus. So it went on around the room, then it came to me. He said, what are y'all people doing? I said, oh, we're having a Christmas. And then she corrected me. She said, no, you mean Exodus. I said, no, I don't mean Exodus. I mean Christmas. And the Lord is saying, will you think that subtle or that big? Most people would have said, matter of fact, one other person said, whatever. No, it's not whatever. Christmas is about Jesus. We ain't got no X. X marks the unknown. You know, X in an equation denotes something that's unknown. No, we know what we are worshiping. And so the Lord says it's in these type situations where God is challenging the believer. And it's like the frog in the water. They put the frog in the water, cold water, pot of cold water on the stove, and then they turn the heat up slow. So that in the end, the frog winds up boiling, being boiled alive because he doesn't realize the water is getting hot. That's what the devil is doing to the church. He's infiltrated the church and caused us to relatives because, you know, that's the last line of defense. Okay, they're all about family. Well, let's see if they will deny me for the family. And this is what Jesus actually meant when he said that if any man will not deny himself, if he will not, if he will uh, not deny or forsake mother, father, sister, brother, he wasn't telling people to hate their family. What he was saying is if you are put in a situation where you've got to choose me, like First Lady said, when the Antichrist comes, now, it's going to be overt, and it's going to be clear. You need to take the mark of the beast, or you don't get to buy, trade, or do anything. My prayer for all of you, for all of you out there watching on Facebook and YouTube, is you get saved today. Because if you can't live holy when the Holy Spirit is here, if you can't stand up on the bus and say somebody said, do you go to church? And you start looking around to see who's listening. 
If you can't even do that, how are you going to stand? And some people think it's going to be as simple yes. as getting your head cut off. Mm -hmm. First lady was saying earlier, somebody came in here and put a gun to your head and say, denounce Jesus or die. A lot of people may actually do that. They would say, no, I'm not denouncing Jesus. Don't blow my head off. Why? It's quick and it's instant. You with the Lord. But put you in a situation where you got to watch your children stop. You and your children living in an abandoned building. Running around, sneaking around at night. Because you can't come out in the daytime. You can't go in the store. You can't go to the hospital. You can't work. And that's going to happen. During the tribulation. Yes. But the Lord is saying. Now is the acceptable yes. time. And the Lord says to them. In three Hebrews 3 and 10. He said they do always err. In their heart. He said I was grieved with them. Not that they denounced God openly. But in their heart. He said they grieved me. Because they do Air in their heart. Your heart is what drives you. Your soul. You let something get down in you. That's why Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that corrupts him. It's when you let something get in your spirit, you will struggle. I tell all my children, and the mother tells them too, know who you dating before you fall in love. Because once that love gets from your head, when it goes from being infatuation to love, you've got a problem on your hand. And parents just sit around all the time shaking their heads and say, I just don't know what they say. I just can't figure it out. They treat them like a dog. They treat them like a dog. And they can't break away. You let something get in your heart, it owns you. And only the Lord can drive it out. Then the Lord said, when he does drive it out, you got to put the Holy Ghost in there because that demon is coming back. When the evil spirit is cast out of a man in Luke 7, say he goes to and fro in dry places seeking rest and finding none, he says to himself, let me go back to the house that Jesus cast me out of. When the demon came back to the nine to ten of the nine lepers, I mean nine of the ten lepers that Jesus cleansed them, he found nine of those houses swept and darkness. For the Bible only records one of them getting saved. When the devil comes back, this is why when the Lord sets you free, yes. you have to purpose in your heart. I need to build in something now that will keep me in peace. Oh, this is what we want to talk about. There is a rest yes, it is. when you're in the Lord. You don't mind the challenge if you trust in God. You don't mind the sacrifice. You don't mind losing. Because I'm saying, Lord, whatever your outcome may be, sometimes your best efforts, it is God's intent for it not to be victorious in our, in your eyes. You don't know what God is doing all the time. But the Lord said. With my mouth. They shall not. Enter. Into my rest. Jesus said in Matthew. All ye that labor. And are heavy laden. Come unto me. All ye that labor. And a heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I am lowly and meek in spirit. And you shall find rest. For your weary soul. For my burdens are easy. My yoke is easy. He said you will find rest. When the spirit. When the soul gets tired. You get weak. The soul drops. Your heart. Drives. A professional athlete. He's driven by 
had a desire in his heart to go when everybody else will stop. The boxer, he stand there and they said it's going to be the survival of the fittest. In a track meet, everybody takes off. They're all running. In a marathon, they get down to that last mile or two and nobody got nothing left. All of a sudden, one person starts pumping like he just started the race. It's the drive. In his heart. This is where the Holy Spirit is. He will push us when we can't go no further because that's what God does. When you're burdened down, God says, I'll lift you up. He said, When the enemy shall rush in like a flood, he said, I'll raise up a snake. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Well, just keep um, <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you go back to um, verse 6 and instead of just giving up you know it's not what it looked like it reminded me on um, Thursday when we were running around there were just crazy so Celeste said every door that we and we had like 24 hours to get done to get accomplished what we needed to get done they only gave us 24 hours and everywhere me and Pastor Pig went the door would just shut off <laughs> So Pastor Reddy said to me, Sister Reddy, you never sweat. He was like, what are we going to do next? And he was like, okay, let's do this, Pastor Reddy. And later on, I thanked him, and he told me later on the way home, he said, you didn't get overwhelmed, Sister Reddy, and you didn't, um, you know, it didn't work the way in our mind and in the flesh that we could see. Every, everything that we could think about, it was like God just shut the door because he wanted us to know, I did this, not you, right? And so on the way home, he was like, Sister Reddy, he said, normally a mother would get overwhelmed or, or oh my God, what are we going to do or this and that. He said, but you were just so calm. And he was like, and I said, Pastor Reddy, I said, now you know that I'm older and more mature in the Lord underneath this teaching. I, I know what it is now to say, to be able to rest, even when all the doors is closed. Most people would have been like, now what are we going to do? It wasn't like that, but he had to bring it to my attention. Like, Sister Randy, he was like, okay, let's go here. Let's do this. And within 25, before 24 hours was up, we, we had what we needed. And God was like, this is what I do for you. And I was telling Pastor Randy on today, when God is manifesting himself, you know, people have saints that you think will be happy for you. You're finding out that they're not really happy for you when God is just opening up doors and they can't process how are you doing this? It's not me, but it's the Lord. And I'm learning since the last of the ride for me and Pastor Red. Some things you just need to keep. You know, you want to share, you know, God's, um, his grace and his mercy and his miracles, right? I'm learning. I told Pastor Red, I said, I don't know if I want to do that anymore because I'm finding out. People are feeling some type of way. Like, that shouldn't be happening. Sister Red, how can you do this? I, I'm not doing it. It's God that's doing it. And then, so... What we find is a comfort in if it doesn't work out, Lord, the way I want it to, then that means however you are going to do this, it's going to be better. Yes. The other end of that, the opposite of that, is what Paul says in verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you of an evil heart not a evil dark heart of sin but an evil heart of unbelief when we say we trust God yes, yes. then we don't believe it starts by obeying God's word yes. then we start to see the manifestation of God's blessing yes. grace he gives to everybody Rain, he gives to everybody. Sunlight, you know, the moon at night, he gives that to everybody. But there is a certain rest yes. that Christians have. Yes. And, and sometimes the burden can be tremendous. We sit back a lot of times and we're in awe of our bishop who has on more than one occasion stood up against spiritual wickedness at the white, from the White House.
from governors, from heads of state. And he makes it look easy, even though we know. He said to us one time, people talk about they want to be like him. He said, man, I've had pressures on me that would make the, some people's head explode. He called it, he called them one time when they had, they were building the school and the church. Both of them were mega million dollar properties. And the church was costing, what he said, the church was costing about twelve or $13,000 a month. And the school was costing about eighteen. So you're talking about $35,000 a month just for the rent, just for the mortgage. We ain't talking about the light bill and all of that stuff. And you said the pressure got so hard one time. He said he, had, he just had to pull over on the side of the road and said, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this one. And he just put it in the Lord's hand. So as I was watching my wife the other day, Every time, every attempt that was made, when it didn't turn out the way we wanted to, one thing we agreed on, God's going to work this thing out some way. So Paul is saying, when we have an evil heart of unbelief, we depart. But he says in verse 13, encourage each other dead. Sometimes we just need to be encouraged. Yes, yes. That's what the preacher does. So that's a, he don't fuss. He comes to encourage people to hang in there. The problem comes in sometimes is people want you to be their salvation instead of allowing God to be their salvation. We take on responsibility in people's lives sometimes that's not ours to have. We don't have the authority. We don't have the ability. We're sitting there trying to figure out, man, we done this, we did this, we did this, we did this. Like my wife said, hey, you give me your behind the kiss. Because we can't change. God puts love in our heart that make us not throw them away immediately. But when they walk away, mm -hmm. the Lord will give you the same encouragement that Jesus gave us when he said he left the 90 and the 9 to go see about the one. Yes, yes. But God can't make you come back. Amen. The Lord wants us to desire him. Yes, right. So therefore, he says in verse verse 13, we have to encourage one another daily while it is day. Mm -hmm. So we get down to chapter 4. And he says to them, let us therefore fear. And when the Lord says fear, it is not a, if you don't, I'm going to shoot you. If you don't, I'm going to curse you and make you blind. You better fear me to the degree where you have no choice of your own. See, human fear destroys your will to defend yourself. God is saying, this is a reverent fear. The Christian does not want. They could say it in Psalm 51, Lord, whatever you do, I know I dropped the ball when he was confessing his sin concerning Uriah and Bathsheba. And the Lord took his son. He said, Lord, I know I dropped the ball. He said, but, and I'm sorry. He said, but whatever you do, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your rest. Paul was in prison. Joseph was in prison. John the Baptist was in prison, but they had rest. How do we know that? They resisted evil while they were in captivity. The three Hebrew boys and Daniel, they had rest even in captivity. 
Because they say the worst that can happen to me. Now it comes back to what First Lady was saying earlier. The worst that can happen to me if they, is they will take me out of this tormented world and put me in the kingdom. But the Lord says, when you get away from that fear of what might happen to you in this life, then you are at rest. Yes. Pastor, you keep preaching that. Man, we're going to come down here and shut y'all down. Come on, shut me down. I remember one time Facebook had said, uh, we're monitoring you. And they were censoring my sermons at one time. I'd be talking in a whole sentence with disappear. And I said, that's okay. We still got the church. We were preaching on street corners before we had churches. Remember the Bush churches where we back in the day during slavery would go out in the woods. Find a clearing in the woods and have church. But I tell you what, if you shut it down, it's because God allowed it. Praise the Lord. The Lord saved Saul, Paul, Saul. When Saul got saved, the Lord named him Paul. Paul went to preach. Nobody in Jerusalem wanted to hear nothing he had to say. The Lord said, tell you what, Paul, why don't you go on down here, you know, to um, to, to uh, um, Seophis' house. And I, why don't you stay down there? You're going to be blind for three days and they're going to vouch for you. Then the Lord sent an angel upon him. He couldn't go back to Jerusalem and preach. But he didn't sit there and say, okay, Lord, you know, they came and they shut me down. I can't go in the can't go in the temple no more because I'm not Jewish. I'm not preaching Judaism. And the show can't go to the Christians because they're running from me. They think it's a trick. The Lord says, Don't worry, I got another place for you. So if it's God's will, He shuts you down here. It would not be first time in biblical history that that has happened. So he said to them, let us fear, be eager, be effortful, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest. Any of us should come short. That means you can miss the mark. You can be saved and not be in God's rest. There are Christians today in the churches and they're not in God's rest. You say, how do you know? Because they have no biblical stability. Their stability is religious. They will go along with what the church is doing because somebody else is leading. They will follow along with somebody else, like I said Sunday, who shows courage. People follow courage. However, they will not take a stand in and of themselves. So he says to them, why? Verse 2. They heard the gospel. The gospel is preached every day. Those that are faithful hear it. Those that are unfaithful, they hear it. They choose to resist. Then this last year, they wonder why the devil is having racking headache in their life. Their spirituality just doesn't seem to ever take off. So their idea of relationship with God is they will come to the church for something specific. They don't come to church to meet Jesus. Then when their needs are met, then their desire for church becomes less and less. And the preacher and the committed saints are just speaking Jesus to them all the time. What did he say? The gospel was preached. You got to speak gospel to people. I was praying about that thing. The Lord says, stop trying to rationalize with people with your intellect. When you're talking to sinners, yes, yes. when you're speaking to those that are under spiritual attack, demonic oppression, 
the Bible, everybody in the Bible, they called on the name of Jesus. And Peter would rebuke the spirit, a blind spirit, a dumb spirit, a lame spirit, in the name of Jesus. But his commitment, he had relationship. He was in the kingdom, using kingdom gifts because he had entered into God's rest. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our sight. People have to stop taking credit for what God is doing. Yes, yes. Then God will operate in them. Yes. Lord bless your people. Yes, Lord. Then they take the blessing. Yes, Use it on themselves. Mm -hmm. And you think you're going to get away. <laughs> I like what the young lady saying. When she said, Lord, give me you. Yes. Everything else can wait. Yes. After a while, Sister Blessed, we get tired and we can appreciate that. If the Lord lets you live in the midst. Yes. This is why some folks in the church have prospered. They might be walking around with one leg. Prosperous. High blood pressure. Prosperous. Yes. Yes. Heart condition. Yes. Prosperous. Blind in one eye. Prosperous. Prosthetic legs and hips. Prosperous. Bedridden. And prosperous. Yes. When we embrace God's grace. Yes, yes, yes. Paul said, no matter what condition I find myself in, yes. if I'm in God's rest, I have learned to be content. Yes, Lord. He said, the people that the word was preached to, it didn't profit them. So what does he say? People sit here. <laughs> they listen to an hour pastoretic message. Ah. And the best they can say. Boy, pastor preached a long time today. Got nothing. I was trying to tell my own folks. I said, if you come prayed up and ready to worship, you'll be all right. But you come running in here right before the sermon, I got to spend the first 30 minutes casting them demons out. Then the last 30 minutes, you actually hoping that maybe they'll hear the message. Then when the preacher starts, ah, 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 now you got their attention. Because you're up there, yeah, uh, here, da, 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 da. Yo, uh, loose down, loose down, woman, woman be loose, you know. I'm going to blow on you and knock you down. It's all about showmanship and excitement. Now, sometimes the preacher be excited. Sometimes I be up here and I see people doing this. And boy, I be just getting fired up. I remember when we had one saint that was here. And she's not here. So I'm not talking about nobody here. And she would turn around in the middle of my sentence and look at the clock. <laughs> now, I said nobody here. <laughs> she would sit over there and she would turn, I mean, she would be sitting right here and would turn all, I don't mean uh, of getting a position and just maybe glance. She would turn all the way like this. So that I can see yes. that she was watching the clock. <laughs> and you know what the Holy Ghost would say? <laughs> he would say, go 15 more minutes. <laughs> oh, help us be the Lord said, I'm trying to help her. One thing we know, Sister Lassie, Sister Red, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth will draw me yes. or it will drive me. Now the Lord has been given yes. me. So I will tell you, I will confess, I've been talking to my wife about it last couple of weeks. The Lord has been dealing with me on my delivery. And I, I was saying the other day, I commended uh, Reverend Barnes. How she got out there on Saturday. And boy, after about five minutes, she was running from before the Lord. And it was delivery. All preaching. She was telling the story. Preaching the gospel. You know, came in, man, and tore the house down in about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and she was done. That's right. 
And I said, okay. But one thing my pastor taught us from there, you have to work with the with the with the ministry, with the membership, with the with the church that God gives you. Clearly, I could tell members of that church. They came in the spirit. Or they came out there four o'clock on a Saturday, ready to sing and dance, and she got out there and the PA system wouldn't work. I said, preacher, you better get on out there and preach. Got right, people walking down the street, riding down 301. And we're on the other side of the street. God was riding his bike and just stopped for about 10 minutes. Listen to the sermon. I said, God will get his message across. The word was preached. But the Lord says, it didn't profit them not being mixed with faith. We hear the word. The Lord says, don't do this. Have no fellowship with people that are workers of iniquity. The Lord not telling you to be antisocial. But if you got a friend and they just let you know, you know, already me and you cool. I just don't do the church thing. You know, that ain't me. You know. But I mean, hey, we got a thing in common. We work together. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But we're not hanging out after, after work. Not doing it. You know, hey, Pastor Reddy, we work together. We're a good team. My job is to work with you. He said, but I got a husband at home. I said, okay, that's your business. But I'm going to help you out. Don't bother inviting me to dinner. Not going. The Bible says, the word. I'm like, I like the way the Lord gave it to me when he was talking about how to talk about church folks judging. The Lord says through, through the apostle Peter, he said, you don't have to judge that which God has already judged. All you got to say is, I'm on the Lord's side. I told the folks over at the NAACP, y'all are promoting an agenda that is against God. Now I got problems with, up with the things you, that you, positions you've taken but the things that you now embrace that are against God it's a no brand for me. Yes. I don't need that kind of affiliation. You know, I don't, it's not going to bother me if y'all don't invite me to come up and represent North Carolina again. You know, DAB said, well, Mr. Britt, we're just going to have you come up. But I heard that, you know, you got a problem with uh, homosexuals. I got a problem with homosexuals. I just go by what God says. I had just as much problem with that as I would some guy that I know is married and got a girlfriend on the side. I'm like, look, I'm going to pray with you. I, I will deal with, you know, with you, your relatives or whatever, but I'm not embracing what you're doing. And also, Pastor, when he said about judging, you know, Lord, letting us know also um, and, uh, you have to um, live what you preach also. Um, also, um, what's in you going to come out? I was at the store today and a 93-year-old lady was shopping by herself, had drove herself, and was doing no sales and stuff. And before I knew it, Pastor Reddy, and there were people around in Caucasian, people around me, so I was in, you know, mostly Caucasian. You know, a uh, shop there. And before I do it, Sister Lassa, I said, Ain't God good? Can't nobody let you live but God. She was 93 years old. And Sister Lassa, she was up there. I had one shop for herself, had gone to that store, honey, knew how to count for money, and was just sitting there talking. And I looked at the woman, I didn't care if people standing there looking. I said, You know what? God is good because you got the activity of your limb. I said, You know what? I said, You drove yourself. And I said, You walk up in your right mind. So then, Caucasian lady said, ma'am, you right. She began to give God the glory, right? And the Lord said, see then, so you don't really care for people, but what's in you is going to come out. And the people of the soldier standing, he said, you don't care where you at because it's in you, right? 
And the, woman, and the lady said, yeah, we have long jeopardy. I said, yeah, you have long jeopardy. He said, because my grandpa lived to 103. I said, didn't nobody allow her to do that for God? I said, ma'am, you are blessed. I said, it's God. I said, you know what? I said, King, nobody let you live with God. She said, you're right. <laughs> and so the Lord says again, we want to jump back right briefly before we start. In verse 3 and 16, the Lord says, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he was grieved 40 years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, including Aaron, including Moses, including Miriam. Now we know Moses got saved. We know Aaron got saved. God didn't name the entire Levitical uh, uh, priesthood, a whole tribe named after them. But they did not make it out of the desert. And he said, and he swear, verse 18, that they should not enter into his rest. But to them that believe not. So, what Moses did caused him not to enter into the promised land. Which was to those that came out of Egypt. To those people that came out of Egypt. Canaan represented God's rest. He said you will not enter into my rest. They would have been glad to fight wars because they were now free. They were going to have weapons. So the Lord says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This is why we today cannot enter into God's rest because we don't believe what we read. Now, they'll say, the Bible says you ought to love everybody. But anybody that's been to Sunday school once knows love has a thousand meanings. Love embraces your outcome as well as the condition you're in. I can love you and want to affect a godly outcome, but not love the condition you're in. My love is for the destination you're on. I have no love for the journey you're on right now. There are a lot of things that people do. And I would say, I have no problem with you as a person. But they have insulated their heart and made their heart so hard that at some point, I can only pray for you. But like First Lady said, we also have to be examples. No matter what you do, I'm going to be an example. Don't expect me to be a punk if you try to violate a member of my family. I thought y'all were supposed to be preachers. Well, my God ordained uh, duty as a man, husband, and father is to protect my family. You come in here, you want to assault my church members, or you better get to them before I get to you. He went to war. <laughs> I know that's my pastor. Then you got people like, I don't believe in guns. And I don't believe in I said, well, praise God, I never had to use one either after I got out of the military. And we trusted God. We lived in some tough neighborhoods. Didn't even lock our doors. But I said, but if you mess around, and get past the Holy Ghost. You have to deal with El you have to deal with Mike Reddy. You won't be dealing with Pastor Reddy. You will be dealing with Mike Reddy. Because I have a responsibility. People try to redefine words in the scripture to support their sin. I heard the uh, the homosexual priest telling Gino Jennings, he's preaching to a mass congregation 
of all homosexuals and summarized the Bible from Genesis to, Reve Genesis to Revelation by saying, God loves everybody. God is love. Uh, do you think if that were true, then why did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did he destroy Nineveh? Why did he destroy Rome? Why did he destroy Greece? Why did he destroy Nebuchadnezzar and Persia and Babylon? Yes, God loves everybody. But God, there is a limit to what we do. And God has said that these things that people do, they do because they err in their heart and they cannot enter into God's rest because of unbelief. You cannot like me if you want to. I'm in Jesus. I'm in Jesus' rest. He says, I'll give you rest. And everybody else is against you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you rest. Yes, yes. Somebody has to stand up and call sin sin. Why? So that the sinner can get saved. Yes. How will he ever get saved if we just sit there and say your behavior is okay? God is going to be, I am going to pray for you. I don't ever pray into anybody's life. I never stand at this pulpit and preach about somebody's life just sitting there in the congregation. If a whole mob of murderers came in here, and I know they were hit men, I wouldn't sit and say, well, I know what y'all are doing here. And the whole preacher's sermon is directly in that. If God gave it to me, I'm preaching. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the Lord says, I said to them, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, verse 3 of chapter 4. For we which have believed, watch this, do enter into his rest. Now, not in heaven only. Eternal rest is when we get to heaven. But Paul writes in the New Testament, for we which have believed, he didn't, he's not talking about Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt anymore. Because he says, we which have believed do enter into rest as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they should enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The works were finished. The, the kingdom, the spiritual rest, it was established before the world was formed. It became manifest when Jesus died on the cross. You can now enter into his rest. For well, he said, for he spake in a certain place on the seventh day, on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. The works was done when God created the world. In six days, God created the earth. The Bible says he rested. That means it was done. Not that God needed physical rest, but that the work of salvation was already in place before Adam was ever put on the earth. Before Lucifer was put on the earth. Before the earth was, the foundation had already been put in place. Jesus affirmed that foundation and made it a reality on the day he rose from the dead. He said, but now the kingdom is now. But the Savior, the Lion of Judy, Judah, the king that sits on David's throne will not be there until he ascends and goes back on the right hand of the Father, which he did on the 50 days before the day of Pentecost. He ascended. He went back to heaven. Told the disciples to go back into 
the upper room. And then 50 days later, the day of Pentecost. Penta means 50 or five. Pentecost. The Lord says it's done. Jesus said on the cross, it's finished. He said we struggle as Christians because we've not we've not prepared our faith to accept we enter into God's rest. And the more we enter in it, the less problem we will have with the challenges of the world. See, the Lord gave me a sermon for Sunday, said we are sacrificing our salvation for other people. That's right. We walk away from God's principles. We walk away from scripture. Because of people. You're going to sacrifice your relationship and do something that is completely against God. Because of somebody you know. Now, what I could tell you, honey, I love you to death. But if you decide to walk off that cliff, you're going by yourself. But we do it. There are those in the church, and it's no coincidence. Satan knows how to persuade and challenge our heart. And we're beaten up about it because we are wondering if God will be pleased. The Bible said, follow me as I follow Christ. So that would be foolish. Um, that's why it's so important that um, as individuals, he deals with us individually and he expects us not to be a um, spiritual pygmy. You know, why should we be spiritually small and bad and we giants and other things? And that's why we want to be a giant. And so why would we go follow him? Because he's going to hold each of us to have to be accountable for ourselves. And our spiritual walk with the Lord. But I think that but that scripture, uh, follow me as I follow Christ, I think sometimes uh, as couples and married relationships, he's telling us like, follow, you know, you're the head. But you could have done that crazy stuff. I'm like, look, no, because that's not the word of God. That's why it's so important that you got to know the word of God for yourself. Because you can't follow me as I follow Christ. If you don't know God's word and God's will, you know, it, it becomes a, a tough thing to do. And so the Lord is saying in these last days that we have to just purpose in our heart to find rest in him. Yes. And God knows how to work things out. Because when we think we've self, we've sacrificed a relationship, down the road, they will come back. Yes. And, and, and if they don't, again, you want to be in a right place with yes. God. One thing first lady said and we got to end. People will envy your relationship with the Lord because they don't understand it or because they didn't. There are people in the church that understand the sacrifice of relationship with the Lord. They're not willing to make that sacrifice. They may be jealous of yours. Then you got people that are not, that don't know the Lord. They call you crazy for doing what you do. You know, they say, okay, she's a church person, I'm just not. And the only difference is, she's a church person, and I'm not. But we in the church know that's a lie from the pit of hell. And they never understand why their life is so up, up, uprooted and man, man, the Lord warns me about things. I don't know what y'all, but as long, for as long as I can remember, I can be smooth sailing. The Lord will put something in my spirit. Say, it's time you pray something about that. And sure enough, it would. But we pray it up. Yes. Sometimes God is saying you need to get it right. Yes. Sometimes God is saying you need to tell somebody else to get it right. Or sometimes God is saying, this is, this is a trying of your faith. All hearts and mind clear. Hey, man, I love y'all smiles tonight. Y'all got peaceful smiles tonight. 
Amen. It's good when we know that we got stuff going on in all our lives. I woke up this morning with a bulldozer. Bulldozing what I thought was my property. At the end of the day, the man said, we're just trying to clean the place up, the city up down there by the park. You know, they, they got this, you know, where they had the incident in the park. So you know where our house is in relationship to the park. Man, they just done cleaned that whole, I told Sister Brady a couple of weeks ago. I said, I tell you what, I don't know who they're trying to impress, but they're, they're impressing me. They're just cleaning up all those weeds and stuff. That that property is right there at the edge of our house. Man, Sister Lassie went in there and they cleared all that stuff up. You can actually see our house from the side now. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you can. It did inspire me to move forward and and ask the Lord to make a way where we can get a lot of those trees cut down, but that's what we really want to do. Amen. But I tell you what, God is worthy. Like the first lady said, you should have did, you should have did that seven months, several months ago. She said, but I tell you what, when he heard that bulldozer this morning, he got about that bed. An hour later, he was going up the road to the county. Father, we thank you today. We give you praise. What another wonderful opportunity we've had to to just sit here and to glean in your word. We come together as touching and agreeing. Gather together in your name. Oh Lord, we just thank you for a, a time of praise and worship and learning. God, we pray spiritual blessings on the, the people of God, yes. this congregation. Lord, we are interceding right now. God, we are seeking you. We're beseeching you, Lord that you will keep damage from storm in, uh, uh, that you will keep it to a minimum, that your people will be saved. Yes. The sinner will be given another opportunity yes. to say, I believe in people that can't afford to repair damaged property and damaged homes. And God, we ask your mercy and your blessing upon them, yes. even right now. And Lord, as we Leave this place. Let us not leave your presence. And we give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.